I remember. Okay. Okay. Hi, Matthew. Hi, nice to be here. And uh, <clears throat> today we will speak about your piece, um, bad, uh, bad lecture on music. Can you just give a short, let's say, short background uh, of the piece? Who commissioned, where it was played, by whom it was played? Yes, sure. The piece was commissioned by the Ultima Festival in Oslo. It was commissioned for an ensemble that I'm part of, plus minus ensemble based in London. And I think we first played the piece in 2015. It might be 16, but I think it's 15. And then uh, we did the piece a bunch of times after that with the group. And I've also performed a piece with other ensembles around the world. And the lecturer part has also been performed in Switzerland by the saxophonist Marcus Weiss, where he, let's say, performed me, which I thought was a very nice and interesting, interesting performance. Yeah, and what is the setup, right? You are a narrator or lecturer, and, and who else is involved? What kind of instruments? Yes, that's right. So it's a 45-minute piece for me uh, as the lecturer uh, or uh, alongside four musicians. And the four musicians are violin, synthesizer, uh, electric guitar, and clarinet. And uh, there's one moment in the piece where three of those four musicians also have a, a brief speaking role got it and there's also one there's also one moment where i joined the ensemble and played drum machine okay got it and what is uh, what is the main concept of the piece so this is the first in a series of pieces pieces that i wrote um a lecture about bad music this is the first one then there was a lecture about listening to music a third one was called a lecture about sad music and happy dance Okay. But we'll just stick with the first one, a lecture about bad music. Um, <clears throat> the piece came about because I I would say for a few uh, unrelated reasons. Uh, first of all, I was reading a lot of literature on not so much bad music, but more the question of aesthetic judgment. That is to say, what's going on when we make uh, judgments that we say things like we like that piece of music or we don't like it. Uh, and so I was enjoying just for pleasure reading that literature but be, that pleasure beyond that pleasure i was also getting some ideas for um for, ex for example i would encounter either real experiments or uh, hypothetical experiments that is to say um scholars who are imagining experiments and i thought i would really like to realize those experiments in, in, on, on this and stage them uh, so that was one thing so in one sense i simply wanted to uh, was stimulated by this literature that i was reading and wanted to see if I could find a way to make a piece out of it. Um, I think the second thing to say is I had encountered a bunch of lecture pieces in the previous few years, most notably in the dance field. Um, I, and the two two most important uh, people there would be Jerome Bell, uh, who, who's made a series of lecture pieces. For instance, one called Veronique Dessenau, which is a personal favorite of mine. And also Xavier Loire. I saw a piece of, he played a piece of his in London called product of circumstance, which is him lecturing um, about his experience moving from being a scientist to a dancer. Um, and it's somewhere in between a performance and a lecture piece. And so I was excited by those pieces. Um, and, and I think last of all, uh, just to say that I, around this time, I also was just getting increasingly irritated by um, certain things I just uh, saw in the way that people talk about music uh, or don't talk about music, I really should say. So to give my silly example, but it's, it is a true story. Uh, I was watching a, a, an orchestral concert at the Proms, the London Summer Music Festival. And there was two experts on stage talking about, I think a Sibelius symphony that was about to be played. Uh, and one of the experts told a really you know inane story about how Sibelius had had some personal, uh, I think he'd broke a finger or something. I mean, really a, a totally irrelevant story. Yeah. Um, and that was their contribution. And the second expert just basically kept on saying Sibelius was inspired when he wrote this one. And I just found the whole thing so extremely annoying um, that it seems to me that there was some kind of unwritten rule in classical music that uh, music is so amazing and ineffable that we're just passing time as we set up the chairs uh, for the next piece. And I don't think that's true. I think that we can talk about music just like we can have wonderful scientists or historians on television talking to general audiences um, and, and bringing out ideas and sharing those ideas with the general public. I think the same thing is true of music. And so 
um, that, that was also, I would say, an aim of this piece. I, I really wanted to share the literature I had learned about aesthetic judgment um, in this kind of way. Got it, got it, got it. And do you have some um, some central message of the piece? No, no, no. and so perhaps one of the questions is, is, is this an art or, or is it a lecture? Um, and I suppose if it was a, a lecture, a proper lecture, it would have a clear message or a clear conclusion or at least would rehearse conclusions. Um, and I think my piece does avoid that. So let's say it's artistic in, in that sense. Uh, yes. I'm being very crude here because, of course, we have artistic pieces which do have conclusions and we have lectures which are more ambiguous. But, but nonetheless, there's a basic um, ske sketch we could use, so that dot, that binary there, I think. Um, so my piece is, does not have clear conclusions, I think, but it does, pr I think, pose uh, many of the interesting questions. I say that without modesty because they're not my questions. They're the questions I read in scholars writing on this que on this field. Yes, got it. Can you just uh, give example of the questions? Well, I suppose one um, question is one of the topics that's one of the areas that's much discussed in the piece is this phenomena, which is known as the exposure effect in psychology, where we, when we encounter something uh, the, the first time, something foreign, really foreign, we, we're unlikely to like it. Um, but when we have re repeated exposure to that uh, thing, um, we, we might find our, um, our our evaluation of that thing goes in a positive direction. Um, and that seems, you know, this, the, the obvious answers there would seem to suggest that we're becoming familiar, accepting the unfamiliar um, and finding finding a way to truly appreciate um, that thing. Uh, but, but I think um, as I explore in the lecture, actually uh, other, other things may be playing out. It might be simply that at the start, we uh, were unable to predict what was gonna happen next. And as we continue to listen to it a bunch of times, um, I'm thinking of a, let's say, a late 1940s Boulez piano piece, for instance, which at first just seems random and kind of nonsensical. Uh, then we listen to it over and over again and we think, oh, it, it really does make sense. Um, but actually, it, that, that's our sense that it's making sense could be an illusion. It simply could be that we're becoming familiar with the, the succession of notes and that our brain is, is sort of in some Darwinian fashion rewarding us with pleasure when we're making successful, successful predictions. Um, yeah. So I don't have a conclusion about that, but I find that an awfully interesting theory that I wanted to share, um, that our assumptions about why we might start to like something through repeated listings might be based on a, on a fallacy. Okay. And what um, and how this sensorial, right, or listening, lecture, listening experience is built through the piece? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that question. Could you repeat it, please? Yes. So, right. So it's 45 minute pieces. How is this my listening experience is built? Are somehow, I don't know, are there parts or are, uh, uh, are it changing? <clears throat> yes, I, I think I understand that. I, I mean, the piece is constructed in, I would say through a series of topics or, or areas. Um, so after the exposure effects, I then explore uh, ancient notions of classical proportions to see if those, <clears throat> if they might hold some, uh, some value or truth for us in, in why uh, we like certain things and don't like other things. Uh, I explore later on cultural issues or psychological issues, yeah. about personality, identity formation, and what that what role that might be playing in, in our evaluations of artworks. So the piece just sort of tours around different ways of thinking about, the, I guess it's, one could say it's interdisciplinary in a sense. I move from psychology to sociology to philosophy. To well, and how many... To and how many topics are you covering? I think I've just I think I've just outlined the main ones. So that seems to be maybe perhaps four main topics, but it it moves a bit more seamlessly, I think, than that. Yes, and yeah, yes, and I saw right the piece that there is a moment when you speak, and there is a moment when you when our when ensemble is play when ensemble is play is playing. How it uh, how it what was the intention? How long or, or How's this uh, and this build, right? How's this interplay yes. between you and yes, that's right. So it's and that's one way perhaps that it really is a performance more than a sort of academic lecture. Um, and maybe I could say a few things about that. Uh, the first way that I think it's a performance, not an academic lecture, is that it it inverts the usual way that we have the the usual role of examples. 
in a normal lecture, we have something explained to us and then we hear the example um, to sort of prove or illustrate the, the point. Whereas here, I, I usually do it the other way around. We, we usually, I first present the thing and actually the audience has probably no idea what that thing is, what, what the subject matter is going to be that I'm going to talk about. Um, and I like that confusion. And I also like the fact that the audience first has contact with the thing aesthetically before I frame it uh, under a certain uh, lens. But that's one way. And another way is that, yes, indeed, there's a kind of interplay, as you describe, between the music and the text. And not only between music and text, but also music uh, sometimes will sit underneath the text. Uh, so I try and absolutely, you know, I, I made the piece, a draft of the piece on GarageBand before I made it and really thought about almost like a podcast, I suppose, um, uh, but to try and sort of, it, I, I would say it has a certain dramatic structure too, uh, to it as well. And uh, right, you said that there are examples and then your explanations. Are those examples are purely created by you or are they taken as the fragments from other uh, pieces? So all the music in the piece, I think, is original, but the ideas behind the examples are all from other people. I mean, that's so the, fir the first piece is, is I, I wrote the worst 40 seconds of music that I could write. And, and the ensemble plays it over and over again to test out this theory to see whether the audience will grow to like it through repeated experience. Um, and uh, yes, I, I'm trying to think of other examples. There's, there's another example later in the piece um, about, um, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit complicated to try and explain it quickly, but, but you know, I, I describe something and ask the audience to try and listen out for it, to try and follow something in particular. Um, so, uh, so I'm, I think that's perhaps another thing we haven't I haven't said before, which is what I, one of the things I find really interesting about this project, uh, in a, is just simply the, the idea of how uh, text or discourse can frame the way we listen. Uh, I suppose it's it's a sort of contemporary version of program music in the sense that um, you know when we when we listen to Berlioz's Symphony Fantastic, we can just listen to it as music, but if we listen to it through the story, we have a different kind of experience. We hear the music differently. Um, and in this more kind of positivist way with this psychological literature, I also find it interesting that the listening shift, as I said before, you might first hear it without knowing what the topic is and you just hear it aesthetically, but then you're told to listen to it in a certain way. Uh, and I think that's, I guess it's, I find that interesting in a kind of conceptual sense. Got it. And <clears throat> one question right regarding this lecture aspect, did you use some kind of uh, PowerPoint as well? Or it's only uh, no sound, uh, only it's only you you just speak there's no powerpoint in this one i mean there, there could have been but i um there's not no got it uh, <clears throat> and how you compose please right what kind of process uh how, how long it took and what kind of process or stages you you went through to, comp to make this particular lecture about bad music yes Yes, I mean, the process for, for this is unusual in the sense that the process, the first six months of the process was just reading um, the literature on the topic of aesthetic judgment. So just becoming as knowledgeable as I could about that uh, issue from all these different perspectives that we've been talking about, writing notes down what I thought were the most interesting points, but also always looking for these examples of what I could stage for an audience. That's, you know, that's, um, and... Beyond that, um, then, you know, it's, it's just more conventional kind of composition. One thinks about the what idea is going to be a great way to start and what way you could, how you can move on from there and how you can come back to things. And and, and so it's, I, I can't really remember from nine years ago exactly how I did it, but uh, I suppose something like that. Got it. And what was, right? So um, what was the main function of, of you lecturing, right? What was the main idea behind putting you as a lecturer in this piece? Yes, I think that's a good question. And in the other two, they're written in the, in the third person, but this one is written in the, third, in the first person. It's written as me. And that's part of the piece because uh, I, I describe, I suppose in a slightly humorous way, but it also sort of functions in, in the topic. My, my quest to try and write bad music, and, and there's, a, there's one, a sort of a side joke that it's actually quite hard to write bad music, to write truly bad music. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think that was the reason why uh, I put it into the first person. 
um it, it was the first time I did it and it was me performing it and so um I, I think I probably just like speaking for myself but as I say it had this added dimension that um I would compose things that weren't bad enough and then pose the question how could I make them worse and share that kind of process with the audience right. and I think I also just liked and we haven't really spoken about this but I you know I think the pieces are can be a, uh, a bit annoying for the audience in a way that I like, that they should be annoying uh, in the sense that um, I say things to the audience like, you will have you will have started to enjoy this piece on the third listen. Now, this is a ridiculous claim, but I guess my rule for the piece is even though it's ridiculous, it's also possibly true. Every, every statement that I make, it, not, nothing is satirical, nothing is ironic. Everything can be taken at face value and should be taken at face value. I, di I don't discuss any ideas that I don't think are interesting um, I, and I, I don't think are, are valuable. That's not to say I agree with them, but I think even yes. if I don't know if I agree with them, I still think they're worthwhile talking about. Um, and somehow that provocation of telling people how they experience the piece, which I wanted to do, uh, was, I think, more effective in the first person. And or, I suppose sometimes in the second person. You will. <laughs> Can you imagine uh, the same piece, but without uh, you as a lecturer? What did you, yes, what well, did you do? So this piece has been performed once with Marcus Weiss in my role, um, and we spoke about that, and he decided to perform it as if he was me. So th there was two choices there. He could either We could either rewrite the text, and he would write it as a kind of proxy for me and acknowledge that he wasn't me and describe the composer refer to, to me or and we thought this was much more fun he could just pretend to be me and that's what yes. we decided to do okay and uh right mm. can you imagine it's uh this piece but uh let's say let's do right a new radical uh, so let's um if if we would cut out your narrative parts, would it still be, can you imagine that piece? And, and would still it make sense? No, I think it would make no sense. And I think the music is crap. Uh, I think the music, I think the music is, I'm very happy with the music, but I think the music needs the text to bring it to life. Uh, so people come and tell me afterwards that they, they like music in the piece that I told them they didn't like and, and the opposite. Um, but I only so people tell people say that the claims I make are not true. People might tell me that they would like the music uh, without the text around it. Um, but my my strong feeling is that the text is essential to bring the music to really it really activates the music in in a, in a, in a way that without the text would be it would be pretty empty. Yes, and can you imagine a worse version? Let's say we cut out musical parts and just put the a pure lecture would still uh, work yes I, I i i work at a university and i give top lectures that would be much more just simply like that um but i and i i, I don't want this piece to be played in universities i want it to be played in concert halls i think it's really fun to go into the space where we do evaluating aesthetic evaluation and talk about it in that space um yep. in a place that's a bit ambiguous about whether it's art or a lecture um but what you're describing just simply would be a lecture. Um, and that sounds fine. That, that's what we do in universities. I suppose one could do it in a concert hall. That'd be fine. Um, but I find it more fun to be in an ambiguous place, I think. Yes, got it, got it. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and um, right within that piece, you collaborate with your ensemble, right? That's correct. And, and and how this collaboration went, uh, and does that collaboration somehow impacted uh, the the piece uh, during uh, uh, no, 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 during the creation process? Yes, I, I can say two things about that. Uh, the first is just that um, we spent four days preparing the piece before the first performance, and I think in those four days, m many little changes were made to the piece. Um, once you, of course, you can plan as much as you can plan and from your bedroom on your computer, but when you get into the room and you feel it in the room and, uh, so I'm, I, I remember well that the five of us, you know, there was, we, we videotaped one of our dress performances and then watched it together to discuss things. And, 
discussed about whether it got visually static and whether I should move at a certain point to just to create um, a certain interest. Uh, so we collaborated in that kind of in that kind of way. Uh, and the second thing to say, I think, is um, while I was composing the piece, I was anxious uh, about this relationship between me and the musicians, and I wanted to find a way to animate the musicians that to I guess to also to sort of just uh, make the most of them on, on uh, but also to give them a, a role that was uh, that might at a, one certain moment um, extend beyond their function, which was so their primary function is to provide demonstrations throughout the piece. Um, but there is this one moment about two thirds of the way through the piece where it, three of the four members go forward and um, say, make statements about their views. Um, they're scripted, so it's not really their views um, about what they think about a particular kind of music. Um, it's hard to explain without watching it. If you watch it, it's, I think, easy to see. Uh, um, but the main point is that it was a kind of theatrical strategy um, to, as I say, extend their role and create a, a moment that was completely unlike all the other moments um, yeah, I, I didn't say that as well as I, I wanted to, but I, hopefully that hopefully that makes sense. Yes, yes. <laughs> and did you use some compositional principles in that piece? If yes, what what they were? And compositional principles, I don't know how, how you how did you work with the sound or how you selected the fragments or ideas uh, to which develop. I mean, there's lots of very different kinds of music in the piece, um, so there's not one answer. It was always finding the right principle, as you call it, for each piece. Um, and I actually discussed this in the piece, um, as in I discussed the kind of logic of how I put together a piece to make it as bad as I could possibly make it, and the successes and failures of my strategies for doing that. Um, so, so some, you know, some. And then, and then there's another moment which is very 12 bar bluesy where I sort of, um, it, it's quite hard to explain uh, just verbally, but I, I, I would say my answer is I, I didn't have one over, I didn't have one overarching principle, that's for sure. But with yeah. each piece, just try to find um, a, a good contrast between it, it between the, the, between the musics of each parts and then, and, and the best logic for each given piece. Got it, got it. And um, what, what have you learned? Uh, during creating this piece, right? Yes, I, I don't think I've. I mean, what I what I learned is really what I share in the piece. So I think if you watch the piece, you'll you'll see what I learned. Certainly, that these are the for me the most interesting ideas of what I learned um, from reading this literature. Um, as I said earlier, I think I re I find so I, I should go back and say perhaps the most important book I read on the topic was by David Huron. Um, called now I've just forgotten what it's called I'll find it in a second um uh and he wrote a book about I'm going to find it because it'll drive me crazy you have to uh great it, I can't believe I've forgotten it um yeah, okay just you just take time and okay thank you if you can uh it's called sweet anticipation uh really one of my absolute favorite books about music is written by music psychologist David Huron um, and his book many of the ideas uh, that I'm engaging with in the piece come from that book um, and I think one of the interesting things about the book it's not about contemporary music but there is a section towards the end of it which explores the question about why atonal avant-garde modernistic uh, contemporary classical music from the 20s onwards um, has never really gained uh, a big purchase in the broader in the broader world or the broader listening public or the classical music audiences. And he says that the most common explanation for that is that the music is too atonal, which we might um, which we might use a synonym. It's just too ugly uh, for that for for people. And he thinks that's not true. He thinks that's nonsense. He he argues that actually there are many atonal or discordant. Um, dissonant musics from all around the world, which people love. This doesn't seem to really account for the problem, um, but rather what he th what he thinks is that the fact that when you listen to, as I say, a late forties Boulez piano starter, that one can in no way anticipate with any sense of confidence what the next note's going to be, 
uh, that he he thinks that that's sort of our, our, his way into thinking about why that music hasn't taken hold is because listeners uh, don't have the pleasure, the chemical pleasures of making successful predictions and also the successful pleasure of making unsuccessful predictions. That is to right. say that we have a, a pleasure when we think we're going to get something, when we're confident about it, we don't. And that we, we notice that we're excited what's happening. Uh, but he thinks that this whole realm of human experience that he thinks, um, he, he argues, we've evolved to have, but we, we didn't evolve these capacities for art, but these capacities are nonetheless used, harnessed by art. And the fact that all this 20th century atonal music isn't engaging it, um, is for him the best explanation for why it's never gained a bigger public. So I, I find that it just, I, I'm not saying I agree with this theory, but I find it tr totally interesting and it seems plausible to be considered seriously. Um, so that, that's a good example, I think, of yeah, something that I learned that I, yeah. um, that I intuitively um, mapped onto some of my own experiences. Very interesting. And what would be the last, last question? What would be your suggestion, right, for composers who have never written any lecture piece, but who would like to? Well, you know, to do it, that would be a. I would. I would be positive about the idea. Um, and yes, I think there's lots. You know, I think you just need a. <laughs> you need a good topic. Um, so I think. Um, I, I must say, I think bad music was like a. I was a lucky, lucky that I chose a, a good topic, um, and I had other ideas for other lecture pieces which I gave up on because they just weren't good topics. Um, a good topic has to be like good in itself; it's an interesting topic, but also good in the way that it presents you with material to stage on a in a concert hall with a with an ensemble. Um, so, but I, I'm not sure. Just to say that there's various questions like who. who sort of dramaturgical questions like who are you as a lecturer what's your lecturing character or style um uh, this, these are fun things to think about is that style or character or register fixed or is it going to change across the piece uh, i mean I, I i could say many more things but um I, i'm i'm i'll be glad if there's more lecture pieces coming i find it a totally interesting for forum thank you very much matthew okay Good.